Welcome to Jerusalem in the first century, as understood by the app called Immersive Herod's Temple. You can get this app for free and explore yourself. Thank you for meeting me at the Chulda Gates. We enter on the right and we'll exit on the left. I see you have done everything you need to go to the temple. You have your sheep ready for the Thanksgiving sacrifice. You have gone to the waters of the mikveh and become pure. And thank you for not wearing any shoes. This mount, which we are about to see, was the construction of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a very powerful, ruthless leader at the end of the first century BC, and he renovated and rebuilt the second temple in Jerusalem. The first temple of King Solomon was destroyed many centuries earlier. And he built this with about 11,000 people, and it took about nine, 10 years. And what we're looking right here in the back, the first thing you see is Herod built for himself a royal portico, a royal court, where he and all those officials who were with him would be able to spend their time at the center of Jerusalem, and that means at the temple. So here we have the royal court, and this is where if you had any connection with the great, mighty, and cruel Herod, you would be able to come here and spend your time. And this would protect you not only from rain, but perhaps more importantly, from the blazing sun in Jerusalem, especially in those summer months. So this is the royal court. Josephus calls it one of the most magnificent buildings ever, but here it is. We are now leaving the royal court and we are at the court of the Gentiles. This would be the last place where a non-Jew would be able to be in the temple itself. And at this time, this means the Romans. And there would have been people selling many, many different things here. You can imagine, for example, there being money changers so that people could change their money to give the exact half shekel to the temple. And so at this point, there would be many stores, especially in the porches surrounding this area. Here we come up to the Soreg, which says, Gentiles, you are not allowed to move past here, but don't worry, you can come on my tour if this is where all you would have been able to go to. Here we're going to a region coming up on the Chel. The Chel was basically the last boundary before you're in the temple itself. And the Chel would have been right about the temple, right around it. And like I said, we enter on the right, we exit on the left. So we are moving to our right, and here we see the eastern gate of the temple. This is where you would probably check in with the Levim, the Levites, give them your sheep, and they would also check you to make sure that you went to the mikveh and that you are pure. And so this is the eastern gate. We are now entering the temple complex itself, and this is the woman's court. There are two ways to understand the women's court. It either means that the women would go into the court itself, but no further, or it means that the women would come onto the top porch, such as this, and overlook the women's court. But no matter the case, here we see a beautiful view of the Gate of Nicanor. You can also see some really tall towers. These are lampstands. The app developer based the height of these, which is half the height of the temple itself, on a late passage in the Talmud, and if I were to make an app such as this, I would make these much smaller. But this is one way to understand the lampstands in the woman's court. Let's head back downstairs and enter the woman's court itself. And when we look around, we can just see this breathtaking space. This is probably where families would have enjoyed their sacrificial meals. This space would have been filled with music by the Levine, both in terms of song and in terms of instruments. It's just a magnificent place to enjoy the sacrifice that people have offered. What we're looking at over here are called the shofar rote, the shofars. And what they are are horns, like kind of like a shofar horn, that you would put your money in and you would donate to different causes. So for example, if you wanted to donate to the wood in the temple so that there would be wood, you would put it in the wood shofar. At this point, I'd like to show you the first of four chambers alongside the woman's court. This is the chamber of the Nazarite. A Nazir was a person who took a vow upon themselves not to drink any wine, not to touch or be near any dead people, and perhaps most importantly, not to cut their hair. And so in this area, when the Nazir needed to give his sacrifice, he would cut his hair, throw it on the fire, and then there is a giant pot, and that's where his sacrifice would be cooked. It was a special sacrifice to be cooked. And here is where the Nazir would be able to do all this as well well as eat their special sacrifice. And this was the first of four different chambers. And now let's move on to the second. Here we are walking again through the main women's court. We see a lot of those shofars where the money would be donated to them. 
and here we get a good glimpse of the Grand Gate of Nicanor, and we're passing it to go into our second chamber of the women's court. And this here is the chamber of the oils. The oil would have been used for the sacrifices as well as for some of the baking, and it would have also been used for the menorah. And what we see here are giant containers, which would have a great deal of oil, and this oil would have been purchased by the temple or donated to it. We are leaving here and we're gonna go into something not generally considered a chamber, but it still is kind of a chamber. This is where the Levitical instruments were housed. Those tall pointy instruments were the silver trumpets, the chatzotzrot, and there are a number of stringed instruments as well. And if you check out the book of Psalms, you can actually see many of these instruments named in the introductions to each Psalm. Here we are again, back in the women's court, leaving the Levitical chamber, and we see the 15 steps of the gate of Nicanor, and this is where the Levites would have stood as they sang the 15 songs of ascent. We are now crossing over the women's court, which on a festival day would have had thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And here we're coming into our third chamber, the chamber of wood. The fuel on the altar was wood and it was in great demand. And unfortunately, in Israel, there weren't many trees. It's not a really wooded foresty area. And so anybody who would donate wood, that would be a great thing to donate. And it needed to be stored up and used on the altar. Back to the woman's court, passing more of those shofars. Interestingly, the temple was free. It did not cost any money to enter. It did not cost any money to offer a sacrifice. There were only donations. And here we come to our fourth and final chamber. This is the chamber of the lepers, Sara'at. And anybody who had leprosy, Sara'at, they would come to the temple. There would be many steps in their attainment of purity, but one of them was here. You can't really see it well, but this is supposed to be a mikvah, a place for people to immerse themselves in water. Although you might not expect it, there are actually many, many cisterns on the Temple Mount. That means that these are areas that collect rainwater, and one of them was built so large, it was called the Great Sea, and the Great Sea could hold two million gallons of water. So at this point in time, we are gonna leave the women's court and come and let's take a look at what is next. We are going through the gate of Nicanor, and here we are at the second major court, the court of the Israelites, where everyone from Israel who was not a priest or a Levite, this is where they would stand to watch the animal that they brought to the temple. This is where they would watch it get slaughtered and offered by the priests. And we can see over here that there's a gate that the people are not able to go any further. And also the developers of the app put in this little box here. I'm not quite sure what it is exactly, but perhaps that was a place where the Levites would stand and sing while the offerings were being offered. All right, now let's head into the actual court of the priests, the third and final court. And this is, of course, by the name priests, means you had to be a priest to enter here. The court of the priests on the outside was mainly for animal slaughter. The temple was essentially a giant butcher shop. And what we see over here are all the animals that were brought for the slaughter and each animal will be waiting there while it's alive. Here we see a bunch of knives and you can see these like saws for like chopping off um, pieces of an animal. And over here we see where the animals would be slaughtered. So here we have a table for the slaughtering of animals. And then over here what we have in the temple is these hooks and at this point the animals would be skinned and all their innards that are kind of not being put on the altar and not eaten, they would have been got away, gone away with. I assume they would have been brought outside of the city. But there we have the animals. And once the animal is slaughtered, the priest is going to bring it, but not put his back to the temple. See, we're gonna walk backwards. We don't want to actually put our back to the temple. And so over here, we're gonna go up the magnificent altar. Even in the Torah, it says that the altar shouldn't have steps, so there's a gigantic ramp. And here we have a magnificently large altar where you could have many areas of fire to put the sacrifices on. And here we have some altar tools, like there's the machtet, the fire pan. Here we have where some of the liquids would be. And this is all in front of God's home. This is all in front of the temple itself. Over here, we can see the horns of the altar. There would have been horns. There would even be these two things that are not depicted here, but two nostrils 
where you could pour the extra blood and the extra oil down so that it would drain out. So let's leave the altar and now we are going to start heading over to the main area of God's house, the temple itself. And this is just a beautiful rendition here. You can see the shiny gold edifice, the giant columns, just an, a magnificent place. Here we are coming upon the kior, the laver, and this is where we would be washing our hands and our feet to make sure that we are pure before we enter the temple itself. We are about to enter the temple. Needless to say, this is only for priests to enter. And here we're gonna enter by first ascending the stairs to the ulam, the entrance hall. You could think of the ulam as like a porch or an entrance hall in a house. It's the first step, but it's not really inside. It's both inside and out. And here we actually see a priest in the priestly garb. And this is typical fashion for a priest, a kohen, and we will see more garments soon when we see the high priest. So we are in the porch. For some reason, this app does not include, there would have been two tables here for the showbreads. One that's supposed to go in next week and one that came from last week. But over here, we also see the magnificent columns with the golden vine around them. And that golden vine would have been people would donate money and then they would put the gold on that vine. We're now entering the main sanctuary through the double doors. And as you can see here, and this is something really fascinating that this app taught me much more than anything else, is that there are these little side corridors, and we'll get to those soon. But here we are in the sanctuary, and this is known as the Heichal. And right now we're looking at a priest who is lighting the lamp, the menorah, the gold menorah. And if you think about it, why is there a lamp? Well, this is God's house, and there are no windows. So with no windows, you need some light. And that's what the menorah is providing. The menorah is providing light. I told this to my daughter and she said, well, why don't you have windows? And I thought that was a very good question. So I don't know, but since there are no windows, that's when you get the menorah. Here we see the showbread. You would have the showbread presented to God. And like I said, there would have been showbread outside, two tables for that too. And over here, what we're gonna see is the incense altar and the incense was very important because if you are a slaughterhouse in a hot place like jerusalem there is a lot of bad smells that can accumulate and so over here especially with that frankincense as part of the incense you were able to dispel that smell turning back we can see the entire sanctuary the entire hechal and while this is only limited to priests it is still not the most private area of god's house for that, we need to turn back around and go to the Holy of Holies. On our way here, we see a lot of these plus signs. This is what the app developers have little notes for you to check out if you want to see them. We are now entering the Holy of Holies, the most important place in the temple where God's presence resides. And you notice here that there is a priest. This is the high priest. You can tell by the 12 stones on his breastplate, the Choshen. And in this area, you notice there's not much else. In times gone by, there would have been the Ark and the Cherubim, the Kruvim, but these are gone. So in this space, the only thing that exists is a mark on the floor where the Ark should have been. Interestingly, many people think that they can see that space on the rock, which is currently in the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So here we are in the Holy of Holies, a breathtaking space where only one human being is allowed to enter at one time in the year, and that is on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that is the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest. All right, let's take a look at some of those really interesting caverns in the temple that I did not know about until this app. Let's take a look. Here we're in one section that was probably closed off and not used, but that actually makes it very interesting. If you look over here, you see that there's a little nook for storage purposes. And if we keep going deeper and deeper into these secret compartments, what we see over here, the app developer did something fascinating. They set up a little table with a lamp and an inkwell for writing. Perhaps this is where some of the biblical texts were written. And if you notice there, there's that giant oil jar. That oil jar is the same kind of jar that the Dead Sea Scrolls were kept in. So perhaps there were some amazing texts in that jar. Perhaps those were the texts that we have in our Tanakh, in our Hebrew Bible, or perhaps they were other texts that we do not know of today. Okay, so these are some of the compartments. Let me show you some even more exciting compartments. 
We are now ascending three flights of stairs on the north side of the temple. At this moment, we are walking alongside the Holy of Holies itself. And as we ascend the third flight of stairs, we are going to find ourselves at the roof of the temple. And what we're looking over here, that is the Antonia Fortress, named for Mark Antony. And that is basically what Herod built so that the Romans could have a place to secure the temple and be in charge of the temple, and that they would have an area. And it is ironic that that area, that fortress, actually became a Jewish stronghold against the Romans just 70 years later. And so what we're looking at over here, we are on the roof of the temple itself, a place where almost nobody on earth has ever been to except for us and a few priests. And we are going up and over here we can see a large room and that if we actually turn back, we'll see even more compartments. When you see the purple tapestry, that marks off the Holy of Holies is right below that section. And we'll get there in just a moment. As we ascend even higher and higher, you can get to the tippy top of the temple itself and we see more storage areas. This was a real place and it needed real storage. I really like how they included so many storage areas. I tried getting to the top roof on the app, but for some reason I wasn't able to get there. If you download the app and you're able to get there, please let me know what is on the top of the tippy top roof. But now let's turn back to what for me is the, my favorite part of this entire app. When I was a young boy, I remember learning about this. And what we see here, we are on top of the Holy of Holies itself and you see some cool contraptions. And that's because what we are doing here are lowering priests down into the Holy of Holies inside a box. Now, these priests are not allowed in the Holy of Holies. But there's a problem. What happens if you need to clean it? What happens if an animal goes in there and dies? What happens if something spills and leaks into it? What are you gonna do? So these priests would be led down almost Mission Impossible style, but their feet would not touch the ground and they would be surrounded by this box to kind of protect them from the Holy of Holies itself. And this for me was the most exciting part of this entire app. Now that we're leaving this other area of the Holy of Holies, let's head all the way down and I want to show you two chambers and with that we'll end. These two chambers are found alongside either the courtyard of the priests or the courtyard of the Israelites. We are leaving God's house, the Beit HaMikdash, the house of holiness, and we are in the courtyard of the priests. There is a chamber at the very back of the courtyard of the priests that is known as Beit HaMokad, the house of the hearth. And we can see that fire burning right there. It actually has four compartments, so let's take a look at it. The first one are for the lambs that we can see, the lambs that would be for the sacrifice. The second area is where the breads that would be presented in the Heichal, in the sanctuary, where are those breads baked? They are baked right here in the Beit HaMokad, the house of the hearth. Here we're passing some clothing where you would get your clothing to wear as a priest. And here we see a nice large fire to keep the space warm. Notice how here there actually is a roof, something interesting for the chambers. And where would the priest sleep? Well, they would sleep right here. You didn't go home after your day's service in the temple. You would sleep right here and the app maker made some very nice beds and people would have been sleeping on the floor as well. There would have been many, many, many priests here, especially at the time of the holidays. Now, where did the priests eat? Hey, here it is, right here. The app developers made some really nice picnic tables. This is where the bread and the meat from all of those sacrifices, this is where it would be eaten and enjoyed by the priests themselves. We now come to the third section of this area, and those are the stones from the altar that was defiled in the days of the Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim. And finally, remember those cisterns I told you about, all the water on the Temple Mount? This actually is an area where the priests themselves would go to the mikvah. And just like we said, you enter on the right, and here we are in the water, we dip, completely submerge yourself, and emerge pure on the right. And so this was basically the main area for the priests to live, to eat, to bathe. This is where it all went down for the priests. And here's a convenient door which allowed the priests to leave the temple courts itself and enter into the court of the Gentiles. 
Now we're going to leave the house of the hearth, and we should be leaving the court of the priests, but for some reason, maybe having to do with symmetry, the app maker has what I'm about to show you connected to the court of priests, but it was in all likelihood connected to the court of the Israelites. So this door would have been slightly more to the left. But what we see over here is a door to a large room, which is the chamber of hewn stone. We see some benches, and over here you can see the stone from the Temple Mount itself. And this is where the rabbis would sit and judge cases, and this was known as the Sanhedrin. And this is where important figures such as Rabbi Gamliel would have heard cases and all the leaders, especially those rabbis, would have voted and decided. And now our journey is coming to an end. We are leaving the temple itself. We are now passing past the Chel, and then we're going to pass that fence, the Sareg, into the court of the Gentiles. In front of us is that grand royal portico that Herod built. For those of you who are wondering where is the Wailing Wall, the Kotel, the Western Wall, where might that be? That is to the right of us right now as we are exiting. And we are heading to the second set of the Chulda Gates. We entered on the right and we will be exiting on the left. At this point, a special thank you to the app developers Immersive History for this phenomenal, phenomenal resource, this free resource. It's really phenomenal. Thank you so much. I know the group is a Christian group involved in outreach, and I just want to say as a Jewish person, I found that this was very accurate and had a great deal of Jewish history in it as well. So a very special thanks to them for showing this temple. Thank you for coming on this tour with me. Thank you for sharing your sacrifice. I hope you enjoyed this tour of Jerusalem. If you are interested in studying the world of the Tanakh or Biblical Hebrew, come study with me at the Institute of Biblical Culture. I teach Biblical Hebrew classes. Every few months a new class starts, so come study with me. I would love to see you there. And until then, shalom and enjoy your time in Jerusalem.